Live from Hyperspace Studios with Guy Aitchison and Fawn Baker. How's it going, everyone? So, yeah, we've uh, got Lauren Gregory here. She's, she's our uh, raw pigments uh, representative. And uh, it's been really great to be able to talk to her in detail about uh, the pigments, such as things like what's different between the six different blacks. Why should I use one over the other? What are the different purposes for them? So yeah, so far it's been really great having her in the studio. We've got a design here that uh, Fawn and I uh, started out with just quick thumbnail sketches. And uh, what we've tried to do was both, both just do a round of sketching on our own, just to see what we thought of and not worry about the collaborative part of it quite yet in that first stage. And then we kind of compared those uh, sketches and took it from there. Did another round of, uh, of drawings where we took our favorite parts from uh, the first round of sketches and brought them together into a uh, kind of a master sketch that had, uh, uh, you know, the, the trappings of, of the finished one. And then that ended up getting redrawn again. So we, we did a lot of analog drawing at first. First, we were, uh, you know, the thumbnail sketches were in, in, you know, graphite on our sketchbook. And then we uh, did our, our next round in, uh, in, uh, using tracing paper and a print up of, uh, you know, a larger size print up of the master sketch that we had done. So, you know, it's kind of a process of bringing it all together. Eventually, from there, Inevitably, we went digital with it because that's really the best way to get a clean stencil. Being able to use Procreate is nice because then, you know, for instance, the, the bars on the dodecahedron, we could just use the assisted drawing features to get the perfect lines. And uh, yeah, I was just about to ask Lauren what she thought of the two machines at once. Um, it doesn't, it's not incredibly bothersome considering it's my leg and it's a wide open space. If you were both like, more in an acute area, maybe it'd be a little different and intensified, but it doesn't seem overly dramatic. In a mental sense, it gives me something to think about more. But we're just getting started, so you know. Yeah. Phase one. There'll definitely be a few different stages of discomfort today. So yeah, this, this part of the leg is really a great canvas for collaborations for a number of reasons. First of all, it isn't too excruciating. So having two artists work is not out of the question. Like we found that collaborative rib panels, usually it's best for most of the projects to happen one at a time. I was really traumatized after my second session on my chest with Are Adam and Ty. Like there was really PTSD. Like. Ty's a sweet man. He's not intimidating or scary whatsoever, but my palms would sweat for two years every time I encountered him. Like, ah, I gotta go do something else. Yeah, yeah that's, that's just too much. I think I do remember you telling me that. The next session following that, when we finally got together again at Hell City, wasn't near as bad, but I definitely had to like, mentally prepare. So Medusa's in the chat room and says, uh, hello everybody, she's checking in. Hey lady, how are you? Uh, Trevor Stanley says, wow, posture. 
I think referring to uh, guys uh, tattooing posture. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, Dawn says, Guy is a god, one of the best artists out there. I give my firstborn for a piece from him. Ah. <laughs> We're on the internet. We shouldn't be talking about uh, trafficking babies. <laughs> and your business says, hello. Uh, love it, Lauren. Thank you. James Poole says, damn, I need some work done. Yeah. Hey, Carson Hill says hi. Hey, Carson. What's up? What are you doing on Facebook at three uh, one o'clock in the afternoon? I'm just joking. <laughs> hey, guy, Carson says, what's up? Oh, hey, Carson. Jamie says, I loved your work since the days of Primal Urge. Oh, I forgot to get back. So yeah, the frequent interruption that's going to be happening throughout the day. Uh, we had a storm that blew through here last week, and it uh, knocked over a number of large trees. It uh, took out my pickup truck, uh, thirteen grand in damage. Uh, damaged both cars actually. Uh, it uh, did about probably another fifteen twenty grand in damage to the roof. Gutters, uh, all the structural damage. Um, tree removal alone was like seventy-five hundred dollars. So yeah, it's this is uh, there's been a lot of insurance-related crap going on. But yeah, it was a frightening experience. It happened at like five thirty a.m. and uh, I actually watched the tree go down. This thing is massive. So seeing it wave around to the extent that I found myself thinking, huh, I wonder if this is enough wind to actually take that thing down. And then it did. This thing was a massive tree. So it was a frightening amount of wind, almost like a mini tornado hit or something like that. But it was limited just to our tiny little part of the neighborhood. So there's been a lot of cleanup. Our whole week has been about moving dead branches around. We got the mother of all fern piles ready to go. And uh, yeah, that's that's been uh, August so far. But I've still had a chance to do a number of really fun tattoos. So there's always sanity in the in the studio here, as long as that doesn't get crushed by a giant tree. Uh, Carson's asking, who's that tattooing in the front facing away? Uh, that's uh, Fawn Baker. Hey, Carson. I couldn't hear the question, though. Just asking who I was. Oh, okay. <laughs> who's that fuzzy head? Carson says, oh, hi, Fawn.
So was your uh, chest piece your only two artists at a time experience? Uh, I had Russ and Tofi do the same area on me. Oh, so right, for right. about nine and a half hours. Is that equally bad? Uh, it was totally different. Um, I don't know if I could have had somebody as relentless as Russ and Tofi both working on my chest at the same time. I was telling Lauren this on the way here today. Um, Tofi prides himself on being the heaviest hand in Poland. So there's that. Okay. And I'm not saying Russ is necessarily heavy handed, but he's very efficient. You know, like he gets in. Yeah. So when you're a chest piece, you can do artists. Isn't he sort of semi retiring? Um, Russ? Yeah. Um, it's not an announcement that he wasn't taking on new uh, projects. I mean, he's got so much going on right now. Like, he's he's doing so much for the community right now and other things where, like, I think, I think he'll definitely get back to tattooing again. I think his life is just filled with other responsibilities right now. Those responsibilities are so important to the rest of us, you know? Yeah, the number of people who are using tattoo smart products. Uh, Jared from Cape Town says, hello, guy. How are you finding working with the Soul Nova Unlimited? And have you tried out the, the new Cheyenne Unio yet? Regards from Cape Town. I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're quite, it's your uh, a question you're about, about uh, tattoo machines and what you're using and how you're liking it. Yeah, um, Lauren just turned the volume up, so now I can hear you just fine. Uh, what was the question again? It was, uh, uh, what do you use? Uh, are you, how are you finding the Soul Nova Unlimited? And have you tried out the other Cheyenne Unio yet? Uh, regards from Cape Town. Yeah, I mean, I've... I've tried out all the Cheyenne machines at various different stages of development. Um, I've worked with them a long time, beta testing their machines. And uh, I mean, I like all of them. I just, uh, unfortunately now I'm completely addicted to the simplicity of the cordless machine and the fact that I don't have to do anything, you know? I know that's a really lame answer, but uh, I feel like, uh, you know, with a simple enough machine, you can just completely divert your mind just to the tattoo itself. I mean, I remember the day when uh, there was a lot of thought put into, okay, it's starting to sputter, what do I do next, you know? Uh, or, okay, this one's performing really well right now, so I'm going to make sure I do a bunch of work with this needle group until it stops, <laughs> you know? It's a, it's a completely different era now. And I love the fact I don't have to think about it. So I know that's a lot of people's answer too, and, and it's sort of lame. Uh, but I've been kind of focused on the, the design end of tattooing a lot more now. Like the reinventing the tattoo classes that I teach. There's definitely a lot of technique in there, but it really all boils down to uh, design, you know, strong contrast uh, flow compositional choices that I think are more important ultimately than uh, a lot of the technical stuff, which is, you know, there's actually a lot of different ways to go about doing a good tattoo. But having a good design means that uh, even if the execution is a little bit more painterly and less precise or whatever, it's still going to stand out nicely as a, as a good tattoo because it's just interactive. Good designs can be attractive even if it's a little bit, uh, you know, not quite flawless. There's a lot of not quite flawless tattoo work out there. You wouldn't even think about it because it's, uh, it's just so good design-wise. Of course, in a perfect world, you nail both ends of it technically precise and well designed.
Carson's asking what uh, Fawn's using for a machine. Because I got uh, um, all the info up there. This is a mast tour with a mast battery pack. I think the machine was 80 or or $100, and the battery pack was like another 60 Highly recommend. I've got like a whole drawer full of them. So I just kind of pick out which color I want to work with for the day. That's as economy as it gets. <laughs> yeah, I actually started using these machines, like looking at them as if they were a disposable machine. Like, oh, I'll just get this cheap little throwaway machine. It hits good, it runs good. I wonder how long it'll last. The first one I've had for almost five years now, and I work with it most of the time just because I really do want to see how long it'll last compared to some of these other higher end machines. Hilly Shirley is asking um, or talk, statement and then a question. Um, I've been wanting to put a monitor up streaming for the clients who want to watch the process of their work. I think it would help with their comfort and attention. Uh, what's your experience with that? Sometimes I stream on Instagram. Um, a lot of times I'll have it totally muted, but it's kind of cool. People will sit and watch like for large portions of the time during my session. Um, sometimes it's kind of nice when somebody's got like a partner or a family member or somebody close to them that's interested in their tattoos. They can sit and watch the whole process and like interact and ask questions as I'm working on them. So. I kind of enjoy going live, even though like I may not necessarily get a ton of views, but it, it is kind of like a fun, delightful distraction for for me and my client while I'm working on them. I once, when I had my hand tattooed, there was like a big screen up in the room. We had this whole uh, webcast production going on. And I was able to watch it on the big screen while I was getting it done. It was kind of funny because it was hard to even think with it my own tattoo up on the big screen. Maybe because I've just been involved in so many webcasts and whatnot. But it was, it was sort of a fun distraction. I think it kind of helps like wrap your head around the pain sometimes, like especially if you're getting tattooed in a place that you can't see, if you can't watch it. Like, if all of a sudden you can pull your phone out and see what's being done on your back and why your kidney has this stabbing pain, it all kind of like justifies it and helps it to make a little bit more sense, I think. Yeah. Helps you deal with the pain a little bit better. Well, another thing is a lot of the people that I tend to are artists. They actually would really be curious to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's funny, I don't want to watch it all when I get past me. Guy, do you run your machine fast or slow? As slow as I can get away with. And then, like, a half a time time. I've been giving that advice to as many tattooers as I can. Slow it down. You just have a little, you know, you, you have a chance to work longer on each thing you're doing. Now, if what your goal is, is to zip through it faster, or if there's aspects of the design that that, you know, would benefit from this quick single pass or whatever. Maybe that's time to crank up just a little bit. But in general, um, I found that if you find that sweet spot, you know, you've got the right amount of needle extension and you've got a good stretch and, you know, good angle and everything, good lighting, that uh, you don't need a ton of power. Adding more power just makes it feel like you're doing unnecessary extra damage. Yeah, I watch people just struggling to saturate solid fields of color and they just pass after pass after pass and they're just like laying in a little bit of color with each pass where like if you just slow it down and you stack that color like little blocks and you, you saturate it fully each time, you don't have to go over the skin as many times and then you're going to get a much faster feel your colors up well and it's staying more saturated 
it's kind of a tortoise and the hare sort of no, approach. Mm -hmm. Slower is faster. Yeah. Most of just to be more thorough and methodical when you first pass, you have to need all those extra passes. So yeah, we recently did a chapter on outlining. This is a project that has every kind of outlining going on. Gray lines and color lines, and various different weights and black lines, and no outline thing, sketching with a magnum, or even blood lines and stuff. We've got a lens flare effect. With, uh, Fawn's got a little bit of experience doing lens flare effects, so I'm going to let her kind of lead on that one. So I'm excited to see the color choices that are going to make that happen. Yeah, I'm trying not to get too carried away with these lines when I'm laying over here either. Just get like that first commitment. I want them to be nice and solid and clean, but I imagine a lot of these are going to double back and, you know, give them double or triple light weight or maybe just come in with a bigger liner altogether once we get a little further along. Yep. Get that back clean in there and then really, like, I call these commitment lines when I'm doing it. Like, we're just getting the idea committed and then as we go, we build build the lines be more appropriate for like the field of depth in the piece. Yeah, yeah, how strong the priority that she has in the grand scheme of things. One of the things I love about collaboration is the unexpected creeps into it. This is one of the things that I want to emphasize if anyone wants to collaborate with other artists. We definitely want to let the unexpected in. We don't want to have too much of our idea ahead of time for uh, what's going to happen. You can have an idea for what some of your contributions are like might be what you might bring to the table. We can hope that there's you know, at least a few significant mm -hmm. things that you had planned that you had thought of surprises what's going to make the piece remarkable. In this case, I had not thought of the idea of a, a deep background distant scene. I was just thinking more like, you know, the, the light form equation that I work with a lot. Got a glowing geometric shape surrounded by some kind of cool stuff that light from that glowing shape is playing off of. So with Fawn's first sketch, she opened up that background, took it into far distance, a uh, whole glorious sunset sky and everything going on. That's something that can happen to me. And that's the thing that I never would have thought of. Not that I never would have thought of, 
it's kind of funny. I'm doing a lot of paintings lately, of scenery and stuff. So I'm trying to learn about natural color. I want to be able to kind of evoke those those feelings, you know, and you get being outdoors. I think skate painters uh, have a have a kind of alchemy to what they're doing. Being able to tap into your sense of nostalgia almost. How are you feeling with both of us laying in a way? Not bad. It would be easier when we switch to mags. I'm just saying it would get easier when we switch to mags. It's even easier to get in that rhythm with one of them. Great. Yeah, a lot of this for detailing and coloring. Less of this kind of precise dragging motion. Precise dragging motion. Nice. Yeah. You feel like you're in down the same way you are when you have a dentist built in your mouth. I had to have a dental procedure done recently. It involved a lot of very powerful chiseling, like spray, spray, chisel, chisel, chisel. Yeah. That was completely numb, but of course it was, you know, it, it's a little nerve wracking working so hard on your tool. And uh, I just found myself. Very feeling very grateful that there is such a thing as anesthesia in this day and age. I live in a day and age where I can have dentistry done with anesthesia because that's a very small part of human history, part uh, containing anesthesia. Holy cow, that would have been horrible or just not cool. You know, they would have pulled the tooth, but the infection. No human being would allow it to get a real bit of flyers. They would drill out and then reach in there with the flyers and take it to the phone. But turn into this dummy substance. And it would just not come out when it was drilled. It would have been too ganked out. It's like this busted or got me next. I love your descriptiveness. So as they were ladling out my bone infection. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That bone ladle. I don't know. The quality of a dentist, man, a good dentist is just good to have. You know, good dentists are a little bit more expensive, but it's just like with what we're doing. You know, we want to go to somebody who's really going to care, care about your pain, care about the end result. You know, my mom just recently went to the dentist that I've been seeing. And she was really nervous about, she had a filling that she needed to get replaced, and she was so nervous about it. And I was like, they're going to be so sweet to you. Like, it's going to be fine. And when I picked her up from her appointment, she was like, I've never had such a pain free appointment in my life. I was like, see? 
just amazing the technology and like the compassion how how much of a difference those two variables make well and also some of the same things that are happening you know think about what's going on in texas and right? conventions and mm -hmm. artists are getting together and sharing their discoveries and there's a great new product that's really making life easier and you know the convention you'll hear about it from artists that you respect I'm like oh yeah okay i'll try that and very quickly these the, the best innovations uh end up taking hold and then everybody's life gets made a little bit easier or they're capable of doing more In a perfect world, sometimes stuff just gets cheaper. I'm going to move this a little bit here just to get around here.
I think it's a really boring conversation right now, but we're focused on sort of the most mathematical part of the tattoo process. Color gradients and the outlines and all that stuff. This is where our imaginations are like working in overdrive to make sure everything's going to be like believable, even though this is an imaginary like realm that we're creating, it still needs to be readable and believable. That's what makes sense. Mm -hmm. According to what our eyes expect. Yeah, you got to look at it and believe it could exist. That's my goal with crazy stuff like this. It's like, you've got to believe it could exist. That's, I don't know. That's my goal. So as these pieces wrap here, I'm thinking about outlining this little area in like a cobalt and then pulling it into black as we come further up this way. Okay. What do you think? Maybe maybe this black portion. Yep. yep, black on the underside, but like cobalt outlines in this area. Yep. Do you agree? Yep. As long as it's a stronger blue than, than this. Yeah, I want to go like a rich royal yes. cobalt-y. Yeah, yeah? probably work. Sweet. It is, it is almost like doing it. Talk about native vision, so I see native vision for you looking to come um, okay, so the uh research if you want to spend the uh you have to be able to decide a little bit more about it.
One of the other things that I'm excited about with this is the unusual color gradients that we talked about. And that's one of the things about collaborating is you're going to do things you would normally do. It's easy to get very habitual when you know something works. But if you do like alien plants or something, it's, uh, I'm thinking about our, our garden outside and all the different uh, interesting shape and color gradients that you see. You know, when I say shape gradients, I mean, you have a row of flowers that are opening, but they're open at different set stages. So, you know, you'll have tiny little pale ones that are still closed. And then as if you follow down the row, you'll see them get more and more open and darker and richer. And then the ones at the very tip might even have like additional colors worked into them. Yellow edging or something like that. But it all happens gradually according to some formula. It's not new. So yeah, we're trying to work a little bit of that kind of natural magic into this. Uh, I believe so, yes. Although you might go in there and um Oh, you know what? I think I remember, um, I think I caught something like that, and I may have either fixed it or just changed the wording. You, you know what you might do? You might start fresh and just make another, uh, you know, make an appointment on your on your side uh, for somebody so that um, you just know which date it's on and everything. This is something that full, uh, full confidence in it. Hey, Dave, can you hear us? We believe in customer service so much. We broadcast it live. Yeah. So if you go to the uh, to the text message 
You guys don't want to pause it for a second. I'm going to get you a little forward. I just want to tuck this in the Okay, and then I'm going to write that. Well, I didn't want to really change your position. I was just getting this oh. paper towel on the new piece. So that, uh, okay. I'm about to start rinsing it down. One thing that uh, one of the first large collaborations I did was uh, Karen Crane, and we developed all kinds of terminology for uh, basically when we were uh, getting in each other's way. And that had rock, there the power grip, which is this when you do this, and then the whole tattoo shifts. Right? Power light. I love the tag. Anyway. And then everybody's favorite, touching tips. <clears throat> touching tips. Anyway, you eventually learn how to look around each other. And it's definitely a, a must. If you're going to collaborate, you need to uh, be able to kind of think about how your actions might be causing that. Other end of the tattoo to move.
Hey, I've got a bunch of uh, comments to read off here. I've been uh, clearly neglectful. Uh, T. Von Krieger says, I just got a notification and popped in for a sec. Who, uh, this is Guy, and who else is tattooing? That, that, that would be fun. Fawn Baker. Hey, T. Von. Good to hear from you. Uh, Esteban says, hi, Guy Aitchison. Suzanne says, good to see you back at it with, uh, like, the... the Two fingers on, the, like the thumb and finger out, the aloha kind of a thing. Uh, Let's see. Well, there's a lot of conversations on the chat rooms here. Uh, oh, any suggestions on books? or artists to be inspired by for biomech. Yeah, yeah there's, there's not a ton of biospecific stuff book-wise out there, you know, other than obviously the encyclopedia. Uh, anybody who's interested in bio and does not have the encyclopedia correct, you got the stake right away. Find it at uh, hyperspacestudios.com. Um, yeah. And then, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff out there, but, you know, you're only going to get so far looking at other tattoos to do bio. I mean, yeah, I certainly try to keep up on that. I, I do look at a lot of what other artists are doing, but I'm also really interested in, in seeing what nature is, is doing, you know, and uh, I spend a lot of time before trying to take that in, and a lot of the things that I follow uh, are, you know, nature related, mushroom pages and things like that. And, and uh, I definitely get a lot of inspiration from that. There's a couple of like, uh, insects, uh, Arthropodia, that's a really good one. I thought one is that uh, arthropods are basically all of your exoskeleton endowed creatures, insects, monsters, spiders, etc. So, you know, you definitely want to reach farther than bio to, you know, find inspiration. Um, I know a lot of artists have been messing around with Mid Journey and other uh, AI art generators, I'm getting some pretty interesting results from that. Um, I haven't done that yet, but. Uh, it's you know pretty fertile there too. Possibilities. Uh, Tuban has been posting some of his. Uh, Chris Hall has done, done some really cool stuff. And Sean Sullivan, he's done a bunch of really neat mid journey environment kind of uh, my rings. Brad Becko, Australia. He's he's posted a few. Um, vitally bulgarized is industrial designer and video game designer. Uh, vitally vitally bulgarized. I just recommend looking him up if you're into bio. Uh, really interesting stuff. But he's he's done some really insane mid journey. So yeah, get out there and look at rather than tree stumps. Get up close to things. Uh, look at things that contain signs of processes, growth, decay, erosion, turbulence. That's action. You know, your bio should have action to it. At least parts of it. Parts of it can be static. You really want to bring it to life somehow. Even hard materials can have turbulence. Marcus Lenhardt, he's a really good example of an artist who's taking inspiration from turbulence and, for example, gas giants like Cooper or the clouds and created bio elements that are, you know, made of solid material. Still carry that sense of turbulence.
In other words, your answer is commit yourself to developing alignment in a way that other people haven't yet. And you will have something unique to offer. Thing so, you know, if we're traveling, we can catch you, right? So the tangle thing, their face from black to mauve to red, I think. That's the idea. Yeah, I think that would be cool. It's cool though, because if you invest enough time into, you know, multi line weight, sculpted color outlines, so you work, step back and look at it, definitely has that sort of part of the vibe to it. Look at mm, yes. But it says a lot of just looking at it.
wonder if there's people watching who are wondering. The reason they're not saying anything is because the normal conversation would be so inappropriate <laughs> that they just have nothing to say. Just nothing to talk about. I don't know how to behave ourselves, so we just don't. And I love the stories of my clients who just go into these just, you know, hate filled invective rants, you know, loaded with cuss words and everything. And people are like, calm oh, down, calm oh, down. Oh, and they're dropping hand bombs and everything. They're like, hey, hey, hey. And they're like, what? Is it, isn't this a tattoo shop? What the fuck, man? Can I talk like it's a tattoo shop? <laughs> You're exactly the problem. Although it is true that my daughter learned her first password in a tattoo collection. Oh, I feel like this story is worth sharing. Well, okay. She's still a, like a toddler at the time. And uh, this is actually one of Gabe's events in Albuquerque. And it was a grand old time. It was always fun. This one had these outdoor fire pits where kind of after hours. People just hang out and have a beer and a drink and enjoy the outdoors and fire. You know, we, we had our daughter with us, so any socializing we did, we just had to kind of keep her up away and bring her with us. And so, of course, she's absorbing the conversation around her. And we're hanging out with Craig Briscoe, and I said something about Craig earlier. He's uh, got quite the vocabulary. And, uh, so anyway, we get home, we're trying to put her to bed. And she's playing with the sheets. She's talking about the sheets, the sheets, the sheets, 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 shit, 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 shit time. <laughs> she just found the word, like, I heard this, yeah, shit time. <laughs> and she had this look of delight on her face. And she says, going, shit, 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 shit. shit. <laughs> And Michelle and I are just kind of trying not to lose it because we the last thing we want to do is reinforce, right? And then she calmed down and we didn't hear another shit from her for like another two years. Unfortunately, she made that discovery as she was falling asleep. And lost that thought. Now, of course, she passes like the sailor. I think age 11 is when cuss words are the most awesome. And then we just never quite get rid of that. I'll try to get this back part resolved at some point so that we'll worry about it. I've got this whole 
like very oh, yeah, yeah. still. Yeah, I just didn't get too many feathers way in that area yet. Yeah, not a little uh, tendrils. Those are too far over the horizon. I think. Yeah. Yeah. My phone somewhere in. Yeah. So what do you call holding hands while we're texting? What is that? Uh, you stretch for me, I'll stretch for you. What's that called? You've worked with Killian, right? I love watching him work with a five mag. Or like when he has just like a small line of grouping, he just starts shading with it like a graphic novel artist or comic book artist. And just <laughs> Very superficial. But with the smallest groupings, he gets so much accomplished. It blows my mind. When we uh, did practice together, uh, we spent a lot of time with the bigger matters.
most of the things I've watched him work on were sleeves, sleeve work. Where was the connection? I'm still there. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So no, it's still there. Though. Well, should we check out of this? Yeah.